Central sequential fuel injection and sequential fuel injection are the new fuel systems used on 1996 light duty trucks to meet more stringent emissions requirements and improve customer enthusiasm. These systems improve startup, idle quality and drivability as well as increase torque and horsepower. In this CPT presentation, we'll examine these new engine management systems. While this training is an excellent orientation, you are strongly encouraged to use the latest service information when servicing the needs of our valued customers. The new central sequential and sequential systems are used on truck V6 and V8 engines. This chart summarizes the new engine systems in the right column compared to the previous model year engines listed on the left. Central sequential fuel injection is used on all 1996 truck engines except carryover engine applications in G vans and PG chassis cabs over 8600 GVW and the L29 7.4 liter. Central sequential fuel engine is similar to the central port system used on the previous high performance 4.3 liter V6. Rather than one throttle body type injector feeding all the poppet nozzles, there is now one injector for each poppet nozzle. Each is fired sequentially for accuracy and precise metering control. Central sequential fuel injection will be thoroughly examined in a few moments. But first, there are several other new common features for the 1996 truck engines. A new serpentine belt configuration is used to decrease belt wear. A new water pump bypass system improves heater performance and decreases engine warm-up time. There's also a new cooling fan clutch for improved cooling performance. A new fan will be included as a running change in the 96 model year. On the 4.3 liter V6, a new structural aluminum oil pan is used. Its alignment to the bell housing is critical. The oil pan should be flush with the engine block's bell housing machine surface. The new air inlet system reduces underhood noise. Note that it includes a mass airflow sensor. These new truck engines use a mass airflow management system rather than a speed density strategy as found on previous engines. You'll also notice the new high efficiency ignition system which includes a high voltage switch distributor. The system also includes 100,000 mile spark plugs with low resistance plug wires. Engine management including ignition is controlled by a vehicle control module or VCM. The new VCM is used for OBD2. It also controls the transmission and anti-lock brake functions. The VCM is located under the hood in most cases. Both the camshaft position and crankshaft position sensors are used for ignition as well as fuel control. Base timing is not adjustable because the crank sensor determines base timing, not the distributor. This sensor is the main sensor for fuel and spark. Without it, the engine will not run. The crank sensor is located on the front of the engine in the new timing cover. The L29 7.4 liter engine has an aluminum timing cover. All others have a composite cover. Composite timing covers cannot be reused if removed. Previous truck engines used a speed density engine management strategy for fuel control. With speed density, three inputs are particularly important. Throttle position, manifold absolute pressure, and engine speed. For speed density calculations by the controller, engine RPM supplies the speed. Throttle position and manifold absolute pressure together determine the density, and therefore the amount of air entering the manifold. With this information, the controller determines the amount of fuel needed for proper combustion. With the mass airflow system now on truck engines, the mass airflow sensor identifies the exact amount of air available for the fuel mixture. Inputs from the crankshaft and camshaft position sensors determine the timing of fuel delivery and ignition events. 
These new truck engines still have a manifold absolute pressure sensor, but it acts as a barometric pressure sensor and an input for OBD2 diagnostics. A closer look at the related components will aid in understanding system operation. The central SFI injectors are located in the fuel meter body assembly. Also included in this assembly are the fuel inlet and return, fuel pressure regulator, and the electrical connector for the injectors. Each injector and poppet nozzle assembly is a single unit and can be serviced individually. Within the fuel meter body assembly, the fuel injectors are surrounded by fuel except for the top and bottom. This is similar to bottom feed injectors. When an injector energizes, the increased fuel pressure pushes the poppet nozzle's ball off its seat. Fuel sprays for the cylinder. When the injector de-energizes, spring force overcomes the decreased fuel pressure and the ball seats, cutting off fuel supply at the nozzle. The injector's electrical connection is at the top and on the bottom is the poppet nozzle tubing. The intake manifold consists of an upper composite plenum and an aluminum lower half. While minor cosmetic imperfections are allowable, either component should be replaced if cracked to ensure vehicle drivability and safety. Attached to the composite upper half are the throttle body, TP sensor, IAC valve, canister purge solenoid, and MAP sensor. The PCV valve is located in the rocker cover. It is connected to the PCV vacuum port cover in the manifold upper half. The lower half mounts the fuel meter body assembly, ECT, linear EGR, thermostat and housing, heater inlet and outlet, and the high voltage switch distributor. The upper and lower plenum are sealed with a gasket. The upper plenum seals to the fuel meter assembly with an O-ring. It is important to ensure that RTV only come in contact with the lower manifold gasket corners for front and rear block sealing. Proper torque specifications must be used. On the 7.4 L29, RTV is not used at all on manifold gaskets. The high voltage switch distributor appears similar to a typical distributor, but key operational features make it very different. None of the internal components affect engine base ignition timing. For example, the secondary towers are decoded rather than radial. Also, the distributor's base houses the camshaft sensor. The cam sensor is used by the VCM to identify which injector to energize. The ignition coil driver module is mounted with the high energy coil. The VCM controls the driver module. The module in turn controls current through the primary windings of the coil. Note that the module has no backup mode. Therefore, the engine will not run without a crankshaft position sensor signal because the module doesn't have system trigger information. Fuel system diagnosis may require several familiar tests. Here's a review with the new central sequential fuel injection components. The fuel pressure test requires fuel pressure gauge J34730-1A. Wrap a shop towel around the fuel pressure connection to absorb any small amount of leakage that may occur when installing the gauge onto the connection. To ensure accuracy, turn the ignition on to purge air from the gauge. Be sure it is held stationary in one location. Then with the key cycled on again, the regulator should control fuel pressure to the specification of 415 to 455 kilopascals or 60 to 66 PSI with the pump running and the engine off. Fuel pressure that drops after the engine has been stopped or the ignition has been turned off and the reading has stabilized could be caused by a leaking injector and poppet assembly, damaged O-rings, a leaking fuel pressure regulator valve, or a partially disconnected fuel pulse dampener, known as the pulsator. With the key off, relieve fuel pressure. First, disconnect the negative battery cable to avoid possible discharge if an accidental attempt is made to start the engine. 
Then loosen the fuel filler cap to relieve tank vapor pressure and connect gauge J34730-1A to the fuel pressure connection. Wrap a shop towel around the fitting while connecting the gauge to avoid spillage. The fuel pressure connection on V6 and small block V8 engines is on the fuel inlet pipe at the rear of the manifold. On the L29 multipoint sequential fuel injection 7.4 liter V8, the fuel pressure connection is at the front of the engine on the fuel rail. To test the injectors, continue with the fuel pressure relieved by connecting fuel injector tester J39021 to battery voltage and ground. You'll also need the J39021-210 switch box and the harness adapters listed on the screen for these engines. Set the amperage supply selector switch to the coil test 0.5 amp position. You'll also need to connect the J39200 digital voltmeter or equivalent to the fuel injector tester. Using the Tech One scan tool Check engine coolant temperature. Continue testing with the engine temperature between 50 and 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Disconnect the engine harness at the injectors and install the adapter harness. Press the push to start button and observe the DVM. Voltage may climb during the test. Watch for an erratic reading where voltage jumps up and down. Record the lowest voltage displayed after the first second of the reading. Repeat the test for each injector. Look for any injector voltage reading that falls outside a 5.7 to 6.6 .6 volt range or has an erratic voltage reading. If either occurs, replace the injector as necessary. Diagnosis should continue with the injector balance test. This test should not be repeated more than once on any injector without running the engine to prevent flooding. This includes any retest on possible faulty injectors. If the engine is at operating temperature, allow a 10 minute cool down period. Leave the fuel pressure gauge and injector tester connected. When cool, turn the ignition on. Record fuel gauge pressure with the pump running. Then turn the ignition off. Pressure should drop and then hold steady at this point. If not, fuel system diagnosis must be performed. To perform the balance test, set the selector switch to the balance test 2.5 amp position. Turn the injector on by depressing the button on the injector tester. Note the pressure reading the instant the gauge needle stops. Repeat the balance test on the remaining injectors and record the pressure drop on each. After starting the engine to clear fuel from the intake and repeating the procedure for cool down, retest injectors that appear faulty. Any injector that has a 10 kilopascal or 1.5 psi difference, higher or lower from the other injectors, is suspect. Sometimes your concern about the fuel injection system may be more basic and you merely want to know if the VCM is providing injector circuit control. In these cases, Realize a new Noid light, J34730-375, is used on these central sequential fuel injected truck engines. The previous model test light is used for the L29 7.4 liter SFI engine. Also, regarding diagnosis, realize that the mass airflow system is very sensitive to vacuum leaks. High idle speed, surges, and low IAC counts are indicators of vacuum leaks. If a vacuum leak is suspected, areas to check are the air inlet duct between the MAF sensor and throttle body, the O-rings at the fuel meter body, oil fill cap and dipstick tube, purge solenoid, MAP sensor and brake booster, as well as gaskets for the intake manifold, throttle body, and EGR. For the 1996 model year, all light-duty gasoline engine truck models are OBD2. As you know from training, OBD2 stands for Onboard Diagnostics Generation 2. After a quick review of OBD2 system components on these trucks and their new engines, 
we'll look at the new enhanced EVAP system used on ST models beginning in the 1996 model year. With OBD2 comes a new standardized five-digit system for diagnostic trouble code identification. The first letter identifies the function of the monitored device that has failed. In this case, P for powertrain. The next number, zero, indicates that the DTC is generic and applies to all manufacturers. A number one indicates a DTC that applies only to one specific manufacturer. The next number identifies the particular vehicle system that is affected, such as fuel and air metering. And the last two numbers indicate the actual component or section of the system that is malfunctioning. There are four types of DTCs which are divided into two main categories, emissions related and non-emissions related. Both type A and B codes are emissions related and are mandated to turn on the malfunction indicator lamp or MIL. Type A DTCs are more urgent and set during the first trip that a fault is detected. Type B codes will wait for the fault to appear in two consecutive trips before illuminating the MIL. Type C and D codes are non-emissions related. Type C DTCs are not yet used on trucks. Type D codes do not turn on the MIL or any other light. However, a DTC will set on the first trip that a fault is revealed. Another OBD2 requirement is the ability to view freeze frame information from the scan tool. Freeze frame data is similar to snapshot data. The main difference being that freeze frame information is stored only for emissions related DTCs and represents only an instant in time as opposed to the several seconds that a Tech 1 software snapshot can represent. Freeze frame data tells the technician many of the vehicle conditions that were present when the MIL was turned on. Failure records are also important. Failure records data is recorded any time a test failure is reported to the diagnostic executive, whether emission related or not. Freeze frame and fail records data can be of great help in pinpointing intermittent drivability or emission concerns. In addition, the capture info mode on the Tech 1 allows you to gather all DTCs, freeze frame data and failure records from the vehicle and store them in the Tech 1. It's usually not a good idea to clear DTCs. However, if you do so, the capture info mode will still give you access to the information for reference while you try to reset the DTC. The Tech 1 supplies enhanced DTC information to help make diagnosis more accurate. The history DTC search will only display DTCs that are stored to the control module's memory. These could be any DTCs that are not presently active. MIL request displays only those DTCs that are requesting the MIL to turn on. Last test fail will display only DTCs that failed the last time the test ran. This could mean a previous key cycle as well as the present one for type A and B codes. Test fail since code clear shows all DTCs that were set since the last time codes were cleared. By contrast, not run since code clear displays all DTCs that have not run since the last time codes were cleared. The status of their condition is therefore unknown. Fail this ignition indicates that at least one failure has occurred during the present ignition cycle. This message will clear when the DTCs have been cleared or the ignition is cycled. The DTC status search displays any DTC that has not yet run during the current ignition cycle. As DTCs run and pass, the DTC will be removed from the Tech 1 screen. Tests that have not run will be shown as NR, while tests that fail and pass during the same ignition cycle will display INT for intermittent. Although the Tech 1 can be used many ways to find faults, some are more efficient than others. The DTC information found in Failed Since Code Clear,
covers the broadest range of time. Finding the fault may be difficult because the condition may no longer exist. The history, MIL request, and failed this ignition cycle modes become increasingly more specific in locating faults. The more frequently and recently the diagnostic failed, the better your chances of finding it. Therefore, whenever a DTC appears in failed last test, you have the best chances of finding the fault. A new Tech One mode is Specific DTC. Here you can enter a specific DTC and see the OBD2 conditions related to it. Whether the last diagnostic test failed, whether it failed since the last code clear, whether it's stored in history, whether the MIL is requested on because of this DTC, and so on. Specific DTC is best used when your diagnosis requires that you focus on one individual DTC. Now here's a look at OBD2 components for the new truck engines. Catalyst monitoring not only requires pre-catalyst oxygen sensors, but also an additional post-catalyst oxygen sensor after each converter. The system compares signals from sensors before and after the converter. If post-catalyst oxygen sensor readings begin to match pre-catalyst readings, the system knows the catalyst is nearing failure. For misfire monitoring, the system looks at the crankshaft position and camshaft position sensor signals to accurately determine engine rotational velocity. As you'll recall, the crankshaft slows down momentarily during misfire. The system monitors this to determine when potential catalytic converter damage might occur due to raw fuel in the exhaust system. The misfire diagnostic monitors for misfire in sets of 200 engine revolutions. A buffer of the last 3200 engine revolutions is also maintained to help monitor for misfire. Inside this buffer, the misfire diagnostic keeps a separate file on each cylinder called a misfire accumulator. Whenever a cylinder misfires, the misfire diagnostic not only counts the misfire, but also notes in which cylinder it occurred. This is extremely helpful because a misfiring cylinder causes erratic crankshaft rotation that may make it difficult to pinpoint the exact cylinder where the misfiring is occurring. As this example shows, cylinder one has the majority of misfires accumulated and the diagnostic executive would identify cylinder one as the misfiring cylinder. The other misfires would be attributed to background noise caused by the erratic rotation of the crankshaft. Heated oxygen sensor monitoring means the system observes the oxygen sensors for signal voltage levels, response rate, and heater performance. On this L29 7.4 liter, there is a heated oxygen sensor for both cylinder banks as well as a post-catalyst heated oxygen sensor for each converter. Fuel trim system monitoring is similar to the familiar 4.3 ST models that have had OBD2 previously. Despite these new engines using a mass airflow management system versus the previous speed density, the OBD2 system is still looking at short and long-term fuel trim to stay near a 128 level, or 0% in OBD2 terms. This helps avoid long periods of rich or lean operation. The other OBD2 monitored systems, ECT, IAC valve, EGR, comprehensive components, and EVAP purge are all very similar to what you've seen with OBD2 so far. However, ST models feature the new enhanced EVAP system for 1996, and this new enhanced EVAP system will gradually be featured on all OBD2 models over the next few years. The new system can detect evaporative fuel system leaks as small as 40 thousandths of an inch between the fuel filler cap and purge solenoid. The VCM monitors the system's ability to maintain an applied vacuum signal at the fuel tank. Usually, failure detection requires a cold start with a trip of sufficient length and driving conditions to run the needed tests. Up to eight specific subtests can be run. If the diagnostic fails a subtest, 
the VCM will store a DTC to indicate the type of fault detected. The evaporative system canister is filled with activated charcoal that stores fuel vapors from the fuel tank. Engine vacuum purges the vapor canister during normal driving. When energized, the evaporative canister purge valve allows fuel vapor to flow from the canister to the engine. The normally closed valve is pulse width modulated by the VCM to precisely control vapor flow. The valve will be opened during the enhanced evaporative diagnostic tests to create a vacuum in the fuel tank and then closed to seal the system. The evaporative canister vent valve replaces the fresh air vent used on past canisters. The normally open vent valve now not only allows fresh outside air to the canister during purge modes, but also allows the diagnostic to pull a vacuum on the fuel tank by closing the vent valve. The system service port has a green cap and is located in the purge hose between the solenoid and canister. The port contains a Schrader valve and fittings to allow connection of service tool kit J41413. The J41413 EVAP system test tool is used to pressurize the system with nitrogen. Be sure to follow the tool's instructions. The ultrasonic leak detector, J41416 or equivalent, is then used to locate the source of any leaks in the nitrogen pressurized system. The fuel tank pressure sensor is a three-wire strain gauge sensor, much like the common GM MAP sensor. However, this sensor measures the difference between the air pressure or vacuum in the fuel tank and the outside air pressure. The sensor mounts at the top of the fuel tank sending unit and alters the VCM supplied reference voltage to create a signal voltage. The fuel level sensor is an important input to the VCM for the enhanced evaporative system diagnostic. The fuel level affects the rate of change in air pressure in the EVAP system. The diagnostic will not run when the tank is more than 85% or less than 15% full. The enhanced evaporative system and its diagnostic subtest are thoroughly covered in the reference booklet for this CPT release. If engine removal is necessary, new lift hook tools must be installed since lift hooks are no longer factory installed on the engine. The throttle body assembly service is straightforward. Always refer to the eight digit number stamped on the casting if specifications or part replacement is required. If installing a new IAC valve, be sure it's identical. IAC valve pintle shape and diameter are designed for the specific application. Also measure the distance between the tip of the IAC valve pintle and the mounting flange. If it's greater than 28 millimeters, use finger pressure to slowly retract the pintle. Perform the IAC reset using the normal service manual procedure. Engine fuel pipe service requires detail. After disconnecting the negative battery cable and relieving fuel system pressure, remove the fuel hoses at the rear of the intake manifold. We removed the distributor cap to aid photography. The rear fuel pipe clip bolt is removed next, followed by the fuel meter body inlet and outlet pipe retainer and nuts. Pull straight up to remove the fuel pipes from the fuel meter body assembly. Take care not to bend the pipes. To remove the manifold, remove the air inlet duct and fastener along with the air cleaner assembly and air duct. Then disconnect the injector electrical connector. At the throttle lever cam and bracket, remove the throttle and cruise control cables as well as the power brake and crankcase ventilation valve vacuum hoses at the upper manifold and valve cover. Separate the electrical connectors from the TP sensor, IAC valve, and MAP sensor. Also, pull the number one plug wire from the distributor cap. Then, remove the upper manifold assembly attaching studs. 
Finally, after the canister purge solenoid bracket is positioned off to the side, remove the upper manifold assembly. When removing the fuel meter body assembly, notice that the fuel meter body assembly is numbered to indicate poppet nozzle order. These numbers must match the injector with the poppet nozzle and cylinder. On V8s, the lines cross, so pay extra attention. To remove a nozzle, squeeze the locking tabs together while lifting it out of the casting socket. The fuel meter body assembly is removed by releasing the bracket lock tabs with a flat tip screwdriver. To remove the injectors from the fuel meter body assembly, first remove the lower hold down plate and nuts. Use a small screwdriver between the injector terminals to push the injector through the fuel meter body. Be careful not to damage the injectors by pulling on the poppet tubes before they're free from the bores. If replacing an injector poppet assembly or assemblies, ensure the correct part number is used. Remove the inlet and outlet O-rings, retainers, and spacers from the fuel meter body assembly using the tool supplied with the replacement parts. Note that the fuel inlet O-rings, spacers, and retainers are larger than the ones for the fuel return. Use hand pressure to install the new O-rings, spacers, and retainers into the fuel meter assembly. The black O-ring is first, followed by the spacer, the yellow O-ring, and finally, the retainer. Lubricate the O-rings with clean 30-weight motor oil. If the retainers end up taller than the meter assembly body, don't be concerned. The installed lines will seat the retainers. The new design high voltage switch distributor varies from the 4.3 liter V6 engines to the V8s. There's one for the V6, one for the small block V8, and another for the big block V8. On the 4.3, the distributor is not adjustable. On the V8s, it is. Let's look at the 4.3 liter version first. To remove the distributor, begin with the secondary wiring and cam sensor wiring. The cap is held by Torx T20 screws. Avoid losing the screws. They are not positively retained in the cap as found on previous models. For reference, mark the location of the rotor segment with a number 1. Then loosen and remove the hold down bolt for the distributor. Lift the distributor until it's free from the cam gear. Finally, mark the location of the rotor segment a second time. Use a 2 to identify this mark and remove the distributor. If a new distributor is to be installed on an undisturbed engine, align the rotor segment with the number 2 mark. Install the distributor into the engine. Be sure the hold down is aligned with the bolt hole in the engine. When it's fully seated with the oil pump drive tab mated to the oil pump shaft, the distributor's rotor segment should be aligned with the number one mark. If not, it has been installed one or more teeth off. With everything aligned, tighten the hold down bolt to service manual specifications and install the remaining components. Start the engine and check the MIL. A DTC P1345 indicates the cam signal and crank signal are not properly timed. The distributor has been installed a tooth or more off. The installation procedure is different if the engine has been disturbed. First, bring the engine up on TDC of the compression stroke for cylinder number one. Notice that there are two timing marks on the 4.3 liter crankshaft pulley. One is for the upper tab, one is for the lower tab. Don't confuse them. V8s have only one mark on the pulley. However, there is a second lower timing mark on the front cover. If this mark is used, it aligns with cylinder number eight at TDC of compression. To continue, align the dimple in the distributor gear with the mark on the stem. Next, align the oil pump shaft in the engine with the distributor's drive shaft tab using a long screwdriver. 
install the distributor into the engine. Be sure the hole down is aligned with the bolt hole in the engine. Once the distributor is fully seated, the rotor segment should be aligned with a pointer cast into the base. This pointer has the number 6 cast in it, indicating the unit is for a six-cylinder engine. Eight-cylinder engines have an 8. While segment and pointer alignment may not be exact, still secure the distributor and install the other components. Alignment must be confirmed by starting the engine and check for a lit MIL. As we stated before, a DTC P1345 indicates the distributor has been installed a tooth or more off. On the V8 engines, distributor service is similar to V6 engines except V8 distributors are adjustable. It is important to verify this adjustment, known as the cam retard offset. Use the Tech one scan tool and find the camshaft offset parameter. Start the engine, raise engine speed above 1000 RPM, and note the reading. Then turn the distributor slightly in one direction and note any change to the cam offset reading. Zero cam offset is the preferred setting. If the reading increases or decreases as you turn the distributor, stop and reverse direction until a zero cam retard offset is reached. Tighten the hole down and recheck the cam offset reading. Clear and retest for DTCs. Since base timing is determined by the crank sensor, timing will not be affected in any way by this procedure. Central sequential fuel injection and sequential fuel injection are the new fuel systems used on 1996 light duty trucks to meet more stringent emissions requirements and improve customer enthusiasm. These systems improve startup, idle quality and drivability as well as increase horsepower and torque. And remember, there is no substitute for using the latest and most exact service information available for the powertrain you're servicing. Owners trust service professionals like you to fix them right the first time, on time, every time. You should now prepare to take the test for this course. To take the test, you'll need a number two pencil and the official student attendance and test form in front of you. Make sure that the seven digits of the course number printed in block nine of the form match the seven digits of the course number printed on the course book and the videotape label. Start with the attendance and test form in front of you with a clipped corner in the lower right. This is the only answer sheet you'll need for this course. In the upper left-hand corner, you'll see a series of circles under the letters A through E. When you've decided on an answer, completely fill in the circle under the letter that matches the letter of your answer. Since your test will be checked by computer, avoid making any stray marks on the form. If you change your mind, completely erase your old answer before marking your new answer. Also, it's important not to get dirt or grease on or to fold the answer sheet. Any of these conditions could cause the computer to incorrectly check your test. As you take this test, remember, there's no time limit. Please complete the sections of the student attendance and test form which identify you and your dealership. If this part of the form is not filled out correctly, you and your dealership won't receive proper credit or certification for this course. Start by placing the form in front of you with a clipped corner in the upper right. In the upper left-hand corner, print your last name in block one. Only one letter goes in each box. Print your first and middle initial in block two. Print the name of your dealership in block three. Your dealership city in block four. And the official postal abbreviation for your dealership state in block five. Your social security number goes in block six. Enter your dealer code in the space provided. Put today's date in block 8. Back at block 1, you'll see an alphabet under each letter of your name. Completely fill in the circle of the letter that matches the letter that you printed at the top of the column. Follow the same steps for your initials and for the digits of your social security number, the date, and your dealer code. 
Once you have completed all of the parts of the test, make a photocopy of the form for your records. After copying, put the original in the pre-addressed envelope. No postage is needed. Good luck! To inquire about CPT test scores and to order additional copies of test materials, call 1-800-468-6657. Please have your dealer code and course number handy when you call.